there any public comment? Okay, hearing none. Um, act to approve the minutes of Monday, November 23rd. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion on the minutes? All right, so moved. Jamie, just in time. Sorry about that. Good evening, everyone. Mm, that's okay. Uh, I know we are. We are um, can you hear me? Yep, I was just going to let you know we're to the superintendent report. Yeah. Uh, so I know we have a packed agenda tonight. We're going to be looking at uh, some uh, projections in regards to how our trajectory is right now this year at the SU level um, on the expenditure and revenue side, as well as you looking at a budget. Um, it's budget season uh, that continues to take up a great deal of time at the moment. Um, I am proud and uh, Amy and Charlie can highlight it in their report of the uh, professional development that's been occurring across the SU um, today. And again, will happen tomorrow. Um, there's a lot of great work happening. I want to acknowledge that, um, you know, in regards to the remote learning, I want folks to know that we use that as a tool uh, last week. That doesn't mean that that's what we're going to use all the time. Um, and so what I want you to know is I wanted to leverage that mostly to ensure that we could go remote if we needed to immediately in the event that we have a COVID-19 outbreak. Um, huge success that we haven't had one. Um, and we made it to December 18th. I'm really proud of that. Teachers worked incredibly hard, families did, students did. The good news is we were able to move remote um, after notifying teachers that was the tentative plan at one o'clock the day before, if it, and indeed we did have snow, that we would go remote and we were able to move to that and implement it. So that's good news for us as we move forward, as we navigate COVID-19. Um, I had a lot of feedback that folks appreciated a remote learning day and the materials. Um, I was out in buildings all day on Friday. Uh, most elementary students indicated it took them about two and a half hours to complete the work at the elementary level. Um, some parents emailed me and thanked me for that. Some folks felt like I took snow days away permanently, which, you know, was never fun either. So it comes with the territory of the job. Um, most decisions, you know, make some folks happy and then maybe some others not. But uh, we have it in our, our toolkit. We may use it when we need to. Um, and uh, I'm happy that we implemented it and know that we can move to remote in the event that we need to due to COVID-19. So that's my report in hand. Um, I'll entertain any question folks have. You'll hear from me later in regards to budget and uh, things of that nature. Jamie. Yeah. How are you, Bob? Good. Let's give a snow day once in a while. Duly noted. Just uh, you know, to a team, I said, you know, one of the things uh, becoming a superintendent, you can't wait to call your first snow day. I didn't even get the chance to do that this year. So I think you should do it. Give everybody a break and a surprise. <laughs> Good for mental health. Anyone else for Jamie? Okay, then we'll move on to the business manager report. I did have one more quick thing. I'm sorry, Kathy. I meant to note that just came across my desk today. I will be joining a meeting on Wednesday with Secretary, uh, yeah, with Secretary, with Representative Welch. He's going to give superintendents an update on what the new potential funding package may have to do with increased revenues in regards to education. So I will attend that on Wednesday and have that information as we move forward and share it with you once I find out what that all means.
Are we ready? Okay. Um, ready, Tara, go. Okay, so you all have my report. I had sent it out in the original packets. I don't have any specific updates as to the information that was provided. So if you have any questions specific to that, I will happily answer them. Otherwise, I'm going to share with you the first draft of our projected revenue and expenses for the supervisory union in special education. Okay, I don't hear any questions, Tara. Okay, Ray, do you want to put the email file I sent up to you? As so this up, I just want to let you know I we held off on submitting this to you all because not everyone's seen this style projection and report, and so I wanted Tara to walk you through it. Um, it's been well received at uh, one of the districts that we've been using it in in Rudd. Um, if it's working well for folks at the SU, you'll get this in your report um, when you get the rest of the documents that we send, like you did the budget at the end of last week prior to the meeting. But I wanted Tara to walk you through it before you just received it. Thank you, Jamie. We have another committee meeting going on. Maybe Ray's caught up in that. There it is. Yeah, I was just thinking that too. So this is the revenue side of it. So you'll see on the far left side of the screen, it identifies each of the revenue sources which line up with the budgets. And this is a combined um, SU and special education report. So the first top half of it is the SU revenue side that matched up with the budget. The FY21 budget is the next column. And then over to the right is the FY21 projected and then the difference between the two. So the very top one is where we have our indirect rate, which is a portion of revenue that we receive as a result of our federal funding. So we had budgeted 24,000. I'm projecting just based on what we've received so far to date, that we'll get about 18,968. And please remember, these are just projections. These numbers are subject to change. That tuition, there was no tuition budgeted for, and that tuition that is showing there is actually for a student that we receive in our restorative classroom. And then the next line down is our interest income. That's the interest that we receive monthly based on our bank account balances. And then the next line down is our Medicaid. So the funding sources for Medicaid is based on what we submit to Medicaid for reimbursements for IEP services. So based on what we've seen to date, we have 24 less students in our student count as of our October 1st report. And based on what we received for our first billing, which only covered the periods of July 1st through September 30th, I used that number and projected it out through the remaining payments. We may see an increase in that reimbursement once we do the next billing cycle, which is October 1st through December 31st, because we'll have more active student days and service days during that time frame, so we can see some fluctuation in that section. So that's a, a projection just based on what we got from the July 1 through September 30th reimbursement. We didn't budget for anything under IDEA B, under our state and federal revenue. And then our federal title funds, we budgeted $95,008. I project that we should hopefully receive all of that in the SU for the positions that are offset by title funds for the central office. And then the last one is our assessment that we bill out to each of you as member districts, and we should receive all of that back. The next section down is special education. As you all may recall, that was moved to the supervisory union by law back in FY18. So this goes pretty consistent also with what you saw on the revenue side of the special education budget. We have our mainstream block grant, which is a number that's provided to us by the Agency of Education. 
We have our intensive reimbursement. So that's based on our special education expenditure report that we submit up to the Agency of Education to receive reimbursement. We do project that we will receive less in that, and that's based on the savings that we're seeing on the expenditure side of the budget specific to special education. We don't have anything in for the extraordinary reimbursement. I don't project to receive anything there. The local share of the block grant, that's the 456-620. That's also a number issued by the Agency of Education. We should receive all of our IDEA B basic flow through in our IDEA B preschool. And we've received a little bit more than we budgeted for in our triple E grant by $1,695 to date. And then we offset um, salaries under our special education budget with some Medicaid funds. So we should we'll receive that $35,000 for that offset. And then the member assessment by each of the towns. So we'll receive all of that. So down below the next section, that's the combined SU and special education budget, both revenue and expenditure, which should balance. We're projecting $9,454,444,000 on revenue, so a shortfall of 308,512. The projected expenditure total, when we go to this next page, you'll see this, that I project that we'll, we have about a $27,000 surplus on the expenditure side of the budget for the time being. And then the last section on the revenue page is just the balances that were in the FY19 audit. And then the projections that I shared with you back, I believe it was in August as to how we would end FY20 prior to the audit being completed. Any questions on the revenue side before we move over to the expenditure side? Yes, Tara, this is Don. Up above, you didn't budget anything for an IE. DA grant, but down below you said we have some. I'm yeah, confused. we use all of our IDEA B funds for special education. We don't offset any of the central office. So does that mean you're not projecting any? Not in the central office, no. It'll be down in the special education portion of the revenue. That's why it's all down there. We don't have any of that locally for the so SBA. Why don't we just take it right out of the up above then so it doesn't get confused? I can do that if you would like. I have it there because you're going to see it again in your FY22 budget. So I was trying to be consistent with what you were seeing. Okay. But I can take it out if that's what you all prefer. Don, we can choose to budget that as a revenue stream at the SU level if, if we want. Okay. Tara, this is Mika. Um, I missed it. If you explained the... Um, the intensive reimbursement shortfall? That is based on our projected savings in the special education expenditure side of the budget. That, it, that section of revenue is based on what we submit through our special education expenditure report and then we get reimbursed for that. So if we have a savings in expenditures, we're not gonna get as much revenue. Um, and does that explain the deficit or? I can jump into. I mean, if you grow go up, Ray, the biggest part of your deficit right now is that we overstated Medicaid revenue. You look at right. ninety two six seventeen, and when yeah. we do the budget, when you see your budget tonight that we're hoping to see you approve, you're going to notice that the Medicaid revenue is dropped significantly. And so the biggest thing that we're projecting right now is that Medicaid got overstated as a revenue source when the 21 budget was approved. So you're saying that our, our estimate was off? That's, that's our problem? I'm saying that your estimate and the fact that you budgeted that both at the SU level and in some of the local district levels and we're making certain we fund you locally first, is that there may not be enough revenue that comes in to meet as much revenue as you budgeted. And do we know why that revenue, do, do we know why the discrepancy, why do we think we were getting more than, than we ultimately got? 
Well, I wasn't here to build your budget, so I can't speak to that necessarily. And when we built the revenue side of the budget last year, Mika, we used, as you, if you go back to FY20, we used the same revenue projections because that was the information that was provided to me at the time that we built the budget. Okay, but, but like, why did we think that? Oh, uh, you know, ultimately, there had to have been some rationale other than we're just moving a number from one year to the other. It was based on a projected reimbursement amount given when the budgets were built. So when well, I, under, I understand that, I understand that that we projected that revenue amount. Why did we project that revenue amount, and why didn't we meet it? Is my question. Well, I can't speak to why that original number was done in the FY nineteen twenty term because I wasn't here then either. What I can say is when we built the 21 budgets, I was told to use the same revenue projection. And that's based on at some point, we felt that we were going to get that quantity of reimbursement from Medicaid. I we had that. used the majority of our Medicaid funds at one point to cover our reading initiative. So back three years ago, that may have been a valid projection, but then we also used those funds locally to the districts to offset their local revenue and the revenue that they receive in taxes. So, I mean, I only can speak to what was done in FY21 and the, the rationale behind that and then what we're doing in the FY22 budget. Right, I get why. This I, is the I, 600, what, Kathy? Mika, this is the 600,000. I think this is the 600,000 that Bruce kept saying that we had sitting in Medicaid funds that we could buy all of the books for for the reading program. And um, I think we spent that money on that book, book, those book programs that we started and we didn't really have it there to spend. But Well, first of all, I don't remember it being 600,000. And second of all, we're projecting it as new revenue for this cycle, not as, not as an old reimbursement, which is what we use the book used to pay for the books. My question is, we, we projected it, I get it. Like, I understand that we looked back and we said, let's project that for the, for the next season, for the next budget season. My question is like, why didn't we meet that? Did, did, was it that we didn't have enough, like where does the Medicaid funding, who, who Mika, decides? Mika, Mika, the, Mika the, the revenue was over projected. Okay, so, so, and we get Medicaid funds based on re eligible real reimbursable expenses for students who are on an IEP plan. So okay. at some point we had projected that we had enough students who would qualify and we would get reimbursed for their services on their IEP. That number changes every year based on the needs of our students, what's written into their IEP programs and what's actually eligible for reimbursement. That's how where the money actually comes from is reimbursed IEP services that are Medicaid eligible. Can I cool. butt in here? Yeah. A, just as, so you know, it wasn't that the income was so much off. You cannot um, report income from Medicaid unless you have a corresponding um, expense. So the money can come in, but it cannot be used to offset any other expense other than a Medicaid related expense that you have put in a program before. For example, if, if uh, one of the schools said, we are gonna use $20,000 of Medicaid funds, then we'd say you have an expense of $20,000 and we have a revenue of $20,000. So it, it's not so much that it's been were inflated. It's just been under budgeted on the expense side. Does that make any sense? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. I know this is boring people, but this is like, this is really important to me because um, it shouldn't, it, it, it shouldn't not work. And so it, it does have to do with, with how we're spending this money uh, whether or not we can actually access this, this money and, and, so I'm hearing you that we should be more conservative um, about, about what we project for Medicaid, but I think it's really important to know. So thank you for in, indulging me and, and helping me understand the shortfall. No, it's, it's really important. And, and you know, if you look in this, 
again, the our revenue side is part of our issue, right? And so we just we got to make certain that we're get when we are projecting revenue in this next year's budget and all your upcoming local budgets that it is accurate because we can't sell things, right? Like, and we're trying to trim cost, but if we don't get the revenue right, then we're still left with a shortfall. And Tara is absolutely correct. If you look at that 318021 number, that's the same exact number that was used in the previous year. But, and that number should fluctuate, as Cynthia just indicated. Um, I do have a question. Um, it sounds like that is supposed to be, you know, offsetting expenses. So if the revenue that we're getting is less than what we expected because we're not submitting as many expenses, shouldn't our expenses already be down, also be down? And I, it seemed like that should be the same thing for one of the other categories that was down too. The expense well, expense we're going to go into the expenses next, and they are down some, Andrew. And we're going to we're going to go into those now. Okay, it just didn't seem like they were down as much as now. the revenue side. So. Well, there, yeah, that's, that's I think as we get to the next page, it will tell the full picture a little more. Ray, you want to go okay. down? So the next section is on the expenditures. So you'll see at the top we have that. That's the combined SU and special education budget of that. $9,762,956. The next section down are items that were not budgeted for. The first one is I found out that we have a lease on our Infinite Visions software that we have to pay. So that was not in the previous budgets from what I can tell. So I have added that into the FY22 budget. And also we have a maintenance contract that we have to pay IV every year that I also could not find was in the prior budgets. So those are the two items there that are unbudgeted for that we have to come up with the revenue, or sorry, to pay for this year. And I've put in the expenditure budget for next year. COVID cost, we're at about $66,000 just in the SU right now that I'm hoping to be able to get fully reimbursed through either our CRF funds or our ESSER funds when we get to those uh, reimbursement requests. The next section down are areas that I'm watching that I'm concerned that we're going to be overspending or, or under budgeted for. And right now, just looking at health insurance um, based on what was budgeted versus what we've paid through the fiscal year, with a reminder that January 1 is our open enrollment period. So in February, in March, I will see adjustments to our health insurance bills based on the changes that were made for open enrollment. So I'll have a more solid projection as to where we're going to be, I would expect, in the February and March meetings as well. So we'll update that one as we continue to go forward. And then um, I had spoken about this at the last board meeting that I attended. We have to pay in a new teacher health assessment to the Vermont State Teachers Retirement System. My understanding from staff here is they believed that was a one-time expense, but in fact, it is not. It is an annual expense that we have to pay as long as they, these new teachers who have entered into the teacher's retirement system are employed by our supervisory union. So the bill that we had that we needed to pay for this year was $11,071. So that was not budgeted for in the local budgets. So I have put that in here as an unbudgeted line item that we'll need to, and I've also put that into the budget for FY22. So Tara, that, Tara, that's a per teacher cost? Yes, right. This year it's 1340, I think it is per teacher, and then it goes up a little bit each year. And each each individual district got that bill. So you'll all see it in your AP warrants. So that gives us the projected um, overspending of $311,071. And then the next section down is potential areas of savings that we've come up with um, as an admin team. 
salaries and benefits for people who have left that were originally budgeted for throughout the first half of this fiscal year gives us a savings of about $204,000. We cut out some stipends at the very beginning of the school year, and I had talked about that back in our meeting in August as well. So that was a $26,000 savings. We still had in our budget $110,000 for an HRA expense, which from what I could gather in the research that I did, that was the initial deposit that we had to pay to Datapath. So that is not something that we have to pay every year. So we'll see some savings on that line item and I have removed it from the FY22 budget. And then we have, um, based on what we spent to date on IDEA B tuition, it looks like we'll have about a $90,000 savings there as well. For a total projected savings of $430,261. So as you go down, you'll see that that gives us the projected surplus of $27,397. So I will update this report each month. You'll see it if you like this format, if you have any suggestions, changes, anything that you'd like to make or any just general questions, be happy to answer any I can. Can I just jump in real quick? And then the board can ask Tara questions. Um, so we, as far as the expenditures go, we do expect, Cynthia and Tara have been working hard on getting CRF funds completely um, funded. So I expect that when you look up at that unanticipated expenditure, there will be an offsetting revenue we'll be able to show you next month. Um, I don't have any reason not to believe that. The grant was fully funded. So I think we're gonna be pretty close. And Cynthia or Tara, if I'm incorrect, give me a shake of the head. But I'm feeling pretty good about that. No, I think that would be quite helpful. And I just heard tonight on the radio that we don't have to spend all the CRF funds by December 31st. It's part of the new bill out of Congress. Now, I'll probably be hearing more about Wednesday. So, I mean, that's good news. The health insurance, we need to dig into some more. Um, I'm concerned about that and why that expenditure line is off so much. Um, I don't understand it. And so, you know, also, you know, I think that in general, as far as the revenues go, sometimes that, you know, there was a lot of complicating factors that are not excuses, but why you should be frustrated in regards to how we were building budgets before and just were all the players talking. Um, and, you know, there was some decisions made on your build, budget building last year where I just, you know, I'm trying to dig into and better understand it. And so do know that when you see your SU budget coming up for next year, that we're going to show you tonight, you're going to see your revenue projections are down in areas. Um, and so there are cuts in ex some expenditure areas, but do know that, you know, we also have projected decreases in revenue. The revenues are not held the same. So like, you know, like we said earlier, they're tied together with the personnel. So I hope that this, this you know, projected deficit gets better and better every month. That's our goal. But that's where we're at right now. And, uh, you know, that's our conservative approach to it. I don't see it growing because um, we've dug into these numbers a lot. If anything, I see it getting better. But this, it could be this way. Okay. Anybody got questions? Will we be uh, getting that, that document in the email uh, later tonight or tomorrow? Yeah, I yes, just want to walk folks through it. It'll go out tonight. Uh, great. Um, and are we looking at, uh, when, when, when we're looking at uh, payroll projections, are, are we looking at that with uh, uh, what we're currently paying, or are we, or are we looking at that with a, with a mind to uh, our, our projected uh, uh, contract settlements? We've projected contracts. Um, 
when my one suggestion for the uh, report would be when there is uh, something where you have a potential savings on the expense side and a potential revenue decrease because you're not getting a reimbursement because of the decrease of the expense, it'd be good to note that so that, you know, we can see where it's tied in on both sides. Like if the salary expense decrease this year is causing some of the decrease of the reimbursements, be good to see. We can definitely do that for next month, Andrew. Good. Likewise, um, I, I got a good education tonight on Medicaid. Uh, this is Mika. Um, but if there are any uh, areas where the, um, the expense and funding uh, is limited, so the, the funding can only be used in certain areas and is not general um, at all, it would be helpful just to have an asterisk by it or something so that we know. But um, in general, this is the first time I feel like I've really understood what I was looking at. So thanks so much, Tara and Jamie. I really appreciate it. The plan would be if the board, uh, if they appreciate seeing a document this way, we'll project your expenditures and revenues for all your districts in the same fashion if it's helpful. I liked it. I also think <clears throat> consistency would be great. Yay. I just want to, I'd like to say one thing. I think that that Medicaid was way over budgeted. I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand where that figure came from. It was just an, it was an inflated figure. Um, can I ask a question about, is that something our auditors, have caught or should have picked up? I'm just wondering, because that was two years ago and I remember hearing that figure, being really excited that we had all this money to spend on an awesome literary program and, um, and, and I'm still excited by what it was able to kind of put in motion, but it, if, but if there was a mistake in that calculation, I think that's it, it's my understanding and this is not my bailiwick, that that would be the job of some of auditors to pick up on after the fact well they might uh, uh, this is cynthia again hi cynthia uh, <clears throat> i've been lurking around for long enough to have come up against this um, i appreciate it what the um the number was not incorrect what was incorrect is that it didn't have correspond the thing is with Medicaid is, yes, we get that money, but you cannot use that money just willy-nilly to cut your budget. So it has to be attributed to specific cost areas. And it wasn't. It was just kind of lumped in to the, uh, into the revenue. And, and in fact, that revenue did come, but it didn't have a corresponding... Uh, expense against it so it couldn't be counted. Do you get what I mean? I mean, we might have a little bit left over for next year, but you have, with Medicaid, the problem is at the moment, particularly, you don't know how much you're gonna get and it has been cut significantly, but also, so you have to kind of guess what your expenditures are going to be that you put against it. The only guaranteed expenditures that we've been using are to offset some of uh, Lori Ballou's salary and some of the early education programs, but they're worth about $50,000 and that's it. When we had that program the, li the literacy program, what happened was that it, they took what was on paper and spent the money and it wasn't really there anymore. Does that make any sense? That makes perfect sense. I've in fact done that once or twice. Thank you for that. I always spend everything twice, thanks. <laughs> well, I look back in the minutes and, uh, in the minutes, the superintendent said 
that he would pay for that reading program with grant funds and Medicaid funds. When I added just what was in the budget for Medicaid funds and grant funds it was around $400,000. Where did he get the other 200,000 to buy the program? From unspent Medicaid, Medicaid funds from the years before. I didn't see those anywhere in the budget. Yeah, um, there were re reports. This is Lisa, um, and I was there. And I apologize that I keep muting my camera, but my internet's been wonky this evening. So when I mute the camera, it makes it so you don't all sound like robots. Um, anyway, we were told that there was $642,000. I've been looking for the minutes that, that tell us that. But that was the figure that we were told we had to put toward this literacy program. I remember some pretty pointed conversations. I think Andrew could probably remember and Rodney asking questions, making sure that we had that. And we were shown that that was available to us. Um, and I just feel like, you know, we continue to get to the bottom of the fact to, that, that there wasn't a real awareness of what we actually had. Um, anyway, it's Correct. just so that another, was what I was talking another, about. another symptom of the, the problematic, you know, shifts in the business office that I think we're now rooting out. Thank you. Um, I have a, a more general question. I'm sorry if it's an uncomfortable one and hopefully it's an easy one, but I'm, I'm just wondering, Tara, at what point do you think we will have a budget where we can answer all like where there are big items that are attributable to the olden days like at what do you think next year will be kind of out of that hole and fresh do you think there will always this stuff will continue to creep up based on what we have found and uncovered just in this fiscal year i would say we are in a much better place understanding how we got to where we are today and when you see the budget and when we go over the budget that I sent to you all, we have gone over that budget with a fine tooth comb. And when I say we, I mean Jamie and I and Cynthia and Don to really just make sure that what we're budgeting for is appropriate. And we actually used current staffing, current benefit enrollment, and we built it from what we have today, which I can say from you know being a part of the budget building last year, that is not how the supervisory union and the special education budget was built last year. You know, as we've all, you know, not to keep, you know, digging up in the trenches of the past, but you know, I had assistance in guiding me through how to build the budget, and we've made many discoveries that you know just those numbers were not valid numbers and when you keep building off invalid numbers you keep having issues so i feel very confident about the budget that we are presenting tonight as far as it being a reflection as to who we have in place today and the needs that we are expecting to have in fy22 and i'm hoping that don and jamie also feel the same way and in, in, in the budget process this year uh, can I offer a, I'd like to offer a suggestion. I, I think that, I think that the board members should get a copy of the um, SU audit for 2019 and read it. And there's a hard copy in the central office. I think you should get it. I know it's a hundred pages, but it's pretty interesting reading and you get a good gist of what was going on at the time we were spending a lot of money we didn't have and if if you take the time to read that it it's worth your time sounds like delightful holiday reading bob <laughs> um, does a digital copy of that exist yes it's on our website as are all the audits good Sounds like bah humbug type of reading to me, but I agree that it would be good to do. Mm -hmm. Is there any recourse on this? I mean, I'm just disgusted. 
and not at you and not at, at I'm just disgusted at, at what happened. And, um, you know, is there any recourse? Well, you know, I was just going to chime in. I mean, the question of are we going to fix this in a year? No. I think that this is a I think that this is a marathon because we have districts with deficits. We're going to have to, you know, either budget or bond our way out of it. And we're going to be in tough and lean times over the next several years. And um, I just think that that's our reality. You know, and, and frankly, you know, to be candid with you, I had no idea when I came on as your superintendent that that was the reality. I knew that we had some difficult financial situations. Did I ever think it was this at this level? Absolutely not. And I can second Jamie's statement there. I had no idea what I was coming into until we start to dig further into each of our 98 funds that we have throughout the supervisory union and continue to identify the areas that were a problem, fix them and make sure they don't happen moving forward. In my team has spent hours and weeks and months doing just that exercise, identifying, fixing and making sure it doesn't continue to happen. I think I'm gonna chime in here as the oldie of the group I think the problem started when, as soon as I came in, I realized that every budget for one year was just adjusted for the next year. And then it was adjusted. And then it was adjusted. And nobody really looked at whether things had changed because some principals and some other people would just say, oh, we don't have any money in that one. I'll charge it to this one. So I don't, I think there was a lack of transparency all the way around. And the fact that they, they built, everybody built their budget on what happened last year. And we all know things have changed dramatically, even in the years that I've been there, you spend your money on this and now you don't spend your money on that anymore. And I think that's how we got into our major problems. And the other is what's on paper isn't really in the bank. So you have to really check on those kinds of things. All right, guys, um, are we ready to see the budget? No, no, we got a whole bunch of reports left. That's, that's oh. later, sorry. That's later? We've been talking about it a lot. I know. Right. Jamie, do you want Cynthia to go now on the grants? Because it's a good segue prior sure. to. Okay. Cynthia, you just want to highlight your report and ask if folks had any questions? Yes, if anybody has any questions. But what I really wanted to, uh, to emphasize was the fact that we have used these, the grant funds that we get to subsidize the interventionists. We've been able to um, uh, subsidize a lot of professional development. And I think, of course, my, my area of concern is pre-K and K, and we've taken the uh, uh, CARES funds and used it for a lot of equipment for outdoor learning for uh, pre-K and K, and Tara and I are going through the expenditure, the COVID expenditures, and that will equal well over four hundred thousand dollars. So I think that will look a little bit better on your balance sheet. So if anybody else has a question about what we spend money on, please just give me a jingle. Any questions? That it is not possible to, in fact, still maintain it at a, as a. Uh, I don't have a question on the um, specific grants. I just request that uh, these reports maybe have a, a title and a date on them, just so as they get printed out. Um, 
I, I know when, where it came I'm from. Fault, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I just appreciate that for uh, the future. Thanks. Okay. There's no other questions of Cynthia. Ray, do you have a report tonight? You over? I do. Okay. Uh, dear board, you you have my report in hand. I'll try to bring it up here in a second. In addition to the report, I wanted to mention that in support of uh, Virtual Learning Week, uh, we have sent out over 500 devices and 23 additional MiFi's uh, for students to use that week. Are nice. there any questions? Anyone? Okay, thank you, Ray. Of course. Um, can, I, can I just chime in? Sure. I just want the board to know Ray's taking on a lot of responsibility with running these virtual meetings that we all have. He's on with me every night. And example, he's on a committee meeting right now. And I don't think Ray knew he was signing up for that when he came on as the tech director. In addition to the fact that he's helped me a great deal with trying to provide more proactive communication um, across the SU. So I just wanted to, acknowledge Ray and thank you, Ray, because I know that your title definitely never said that you were going to be on board meetings four nights a week um, in your job description. That's any and all of the superintendent of the So thank you. I echo that. Thank you, Ray. Yep. Yep. But he's right. I've got one ear listening to Rochester Stockbridge over here. Thanks. <laughs> All right, um, Director of Student Support Services. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I didn't have a lot to report the, this time, but I just want to keep the, you informed that time studies are, or schedules are on the front burner. I'm still working, trying to wrap those up with related services, just a little time consuming. Um, and then I have, uh, I finished up all the special educators, so I'll be meeting with principals just to go over those. Uh, each each uh, individual had received a letter from me outlining what I, my findings were, uh, but now I'll go over it with the principals. Principals do have a copy of it, but um, I like to like just follow up with them. Uh, uh, one project that I want to start uh, looking into is job descriptions or uh, position descriptions. Um, I'm noticing that we don't have a lot of up to date, or certain uh, job uh, positions don't have descriptions. Uh, so we're going to be working on those. Uh, child health count, Lori Ballou has submitted to the AOE for the December 1st. Uh, we're about 19% of our population is uh, on the uh, special ed roles. Uh, two major uh, disabilities I outlined, uh, <clears throat> specific learning disability and emotional disturbance. And I gave you descriptions of both of those. So. If anybody has any questions, I'll... Field those now. Uh, Don, you estimate the Medicaid funds, don't you? Uh, I don't. I don't. I work with Lori Ballou, but Tara and Lori are the ones that, uh, you know, estimate those. You have the students that are that are uh, qualifying for Medicaid funds. Yep. Yeah. The, they, they're the students that generate the Medicaid funds. Uh, special ed doesn't necessarily see those those funds. I know that. I, I wonder if the board really understands how Medicaid funds are generated. You want to explain that, Don? Well, it's services provided to uh, individuals uh, through either special education or related service providers. They are billed on a monthly basis. Uh, submitted to Lori Ballou, who files those. So it's it's really it's really services provided to special education students. Can you give an example of what that might be? 
So if, I, if a child, and I, I think I, um, when I did my the time schedules, I, I gave in a scenario of a child that had uh, math services three times a week for 30 minutes. Those services are recorded and submitted to Lori as the Medicaid clerk, and those generate the funding. So if it's if it's a related service such as SLP services, speech and language, um, and they're at different rates. So a professional is at a different rate than a paraprofessional. Um, is that what, am I answering that okay, Bob, or is this? You are for me, I don't, I don't know if other yeah. people understand that, but. Yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can pull together and work with Lori to give you a presentation of, you know, we have to get, for instance, when you say Medicaid funds are down, we might have a lot of kids who are on Medicaid, but we don't have phys physician signatures to sign off. Right. So we can't bill for those. Uh, so there's, it's pretty complicated. Uh, it's more than just services uh, uh, generating uh, this, or uh, services provided generating those uh, revenues. Uh, but I can pull something together with, with the help of Lori and we can uh, present something to you at a later date. Yeah, and I want everyone to know that if, if you don't, if you don't apply for them, you don't get them. Right, and you have like a six month window to file for them. And so if you don't get those in on time, or if, uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, they don't get submitted, you lose that revenue. And one of the things the auditors said in their audit report was that we were late getting um, information like that um, to the state and therefore didn't get all of our reimbursement so i think read that audit report and you'll understand a little bit more about why things didn't happen yeah lori works with a, a rep from the state so that rep comes in every month uh to review her uh reporting uh, and calibrates that so we we get as much as we can but if the yeah and it's important that the special ed teachers turn their reports in yeah, very, very important. So if people are lax in getting your reports in or don't get them in, then we don't get the reimbursement. Yeah, and uh, I've asked Lori to let me know who's who's the straggler so I can remind them, um, make sure that we get those in. Thank, thank you, Don. You're welcome. Anything else for Don? Um, uh, curriculum instruction assessment. Did we do that already? So. No, that's Amy and Charlie. Amy, do you want to highlight? Okay. Yeah, Anything sure. Cool? I'm uh, really excited to share with you all of the exciting opportunities we have for teacher learning and um, the ways we're improving instruction for students in the SU. Um, so you can see the 21st and 22nd, as Jamie mentioned, um, teachers have been able to sign up for a wide variety of um, sessions that relate to our strategic um, plan. Um, in addition to this, Charlie's been doing work on uh, some proficiency work uh, with, with um, transferables. Uh, we've had the ENOA training, which will um, deepen our teachers' understanding of developmentally how math um, and numbers um, progress. And then finally, um, we have some uh, kind of feedback at the end that's coming out of my literacy coaching um, as far as what teachers are working on and what we have to celebrate there. Um, teachers are working extraordinarily hard, and if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to take any questions right now. Any questions? Thank you, Amy. And I'll, and I'll just jump in. I mean, everyone, um, you know, has been stepping up across the SU. As you know, Mary Ellen left and we chose not to replace Mary Ellen. And so I just want to thank Amy and Charlie and Cynthia for taking on some additional responsibilities um, as we get ready to pursue um how we move best move forward but thank you guys amy i have a question yes sir 
do you work directly with the principals and are, are they you know curriculum leadership people um the principals have been very open uh to it you know the work that we've been doing particularly in literacy and they were actually instrumental in helping to come up with the menus of um, offerings um, i partnered with um, many of them to who pulled in some extraordinary sessions that teachers have really been enjoying um, today and will be enjoying tomorrow. So, um, you know, I think that's some somewhere we always uh, can be developing in our capacity uh, building, but I see a tremendous willingness and um, many have, you know, their own areas of expertise as we saw today as Bonnie was presenting in math and uh, we had many other principals contributing today. Are they curriculum leaders? How would you define that, Bob? Well, in my case, I was totally involved. Are they? Or are they on the surface looking at you? I, I just want to know. I, I just want to know that our principals are involved in curriculum leadership. I, I that they don't just say to you, well, do this or do that or, you know, to the teachers. I mean, I. I led. I, I just yeah. want them. I want to know that they are leading. Um, yeah. You don't have to answer that question, but a Amy, if I can help, I mean, I think Bob, we're all over. I think that it's it's a continuum. You know, I think that in regards to instructional leadership, I think that in some places, you know, we still have a ways to go, and in other places, principals are more um, comfortable with instructional approaches. So part of what, if you look at my reports, I keep talking about training up the admin team so that we have a common instructional language. I think that's really important, right? Because how we can't ask po folks to be an instructional leader if folks don't have a, a proficient understanding of what we're trying to implement. And so, you know, I think we have certain principles who are a little more comfortable instructionally in certain areas than others. And the other thing we're looking to try to do is foster the idea that they can learn from each other. Because none of us are experts in everything. So how do we try to learn from each other? Because we all bring different expertise to the, you know, the game. And how do we make certain that we're tapping each other's expertise? I've seen a lot of your, um, I've read a lot of your, um, um, I don't know, um, when you talk about training them in direct instruction and I'm just curious as to um, how involved in curriculum leadership within their schools are they? I would expect that they'd be very involved. And I think you would too, Jamie. So I'm, you know, I don't think we should always have to lay it on the consultants to do the work. I think that, I think that the principals need to jump in and be a, a major part of that. Fully agree. One of the things Amy and I talked about is uh, I was hoping in a non-COVID year to have started instructional rounds by now, where we were doing instructional rounds as an admin team um, to calibrate instructional expectation, right? So we could go pick something in a building and look just to observe that one thing and then speak to it. So it could be the components of a literacy block. And then we would sit down and talk about what did you notice? This is what I noticed and calibrate, much like teachers do in regards to assessment. So, I mean, I look forward to the ability for us to do that after we get past COVID. Because I think, you know, again, Bob, duly noted, you can, you can, um, we can do professional development, we can talk about it. But then often as principals, you're observing it alone. So there's no calibration. And so one of the things I've talked to Amy about is the important that we're helping principals calibrate. And so that's the work she's looking to do as she's moving forward for the remainder of this year. But in addition, how do we carry that work moving forward um, after this year and specifically past COVID? Um, and so we're gonna look to adopt some instructional round protocols to make certain we've calibrated those expectations. Okay. Just so you know how I feel, that's what I think. Okay. Any other questions of Amy? 
One planet. Hi, folks. Um, well, hopefully you had a chance to read my report. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Um, first, a long overdue celebration of uh, a successful summer program. We operated six sites uh, for all eight of our schools. Uh, we were really, I don't know if you can go back in time or remember where everyone was mentally with um, COVID in late spring, early summer. Um, we were surrounded by SUs that decided not to run in-person summer camps. Uh, we had a lot of pressure within our um, regional SU group not to run in-person summer camps. Um, our One Planet administrators uh, and teachers really advocated for in-person. We were looking closely at the data and um, we had done a lot of homework and we had secured our PPE and felt that it was really in the best interests of kids to, to operate. Um, so uh, thank, thankfully, um, Jamie supported that. And um, so we operated, uh, had a great summer. We were only 15 of 30 21C projects to run in-person camps. And only of those 15, about five operated a comprehensive five day a week program like we did. So um, our, our SU was really one of very few in the state to do that. Um, we um, served around 250 kids. Um, we were the first to introduce them to wearing masks and physical distancing. It was, uh, you know, all very new for all of us. Um, but I think it really gave our families and our kids the confidence that this was doable. And um, I really do think it helped us um, be prepared for in-person school. Um, so I'm, I'm really proud of the work that we did this summer with kids. And, um, and, and also we were thrilled at how excited the kids were to, to just be back together um, and kind of relearning those social skills that um, they'd lost over the, um, over the, the spring. Um, what else do I want to highlight? This fall, we, we, the principals proposed um, to Jamie and to myself this summer the possibility of um, running, uh, uh, ending the school day a little early at 1.30 um, with One Planet um, operating an enrichment block from 1.30 to 3. Um, Jamie felt, you know, that we really needed to run buses starting at three o'clock. And so uh, One Planet um, took up that challenge. And um, for the most part, it was really successful. We used um, One Planet staff as well as essential teachers, um, school day essential teachers, um, counselors, paraeducators um, to run that enrichment block. Um, and I, I've heard from families that that really made the difference, that they you know, weren't quite ready to bite off a five day a week um, uh, school day that ended at three o'clock. They were willing to try it till 1.30. And so I think that really just helped families ease into this new environment. Um, we are serving about 210 kids at the moment. Uh, we really are focusing on making our program welcoming and comfortable and we're doing a lot of outdoor programming. Um, we're really focusing on student voice and choice um, and uh, just kind of continuing those um, uh, safety guidelines into the afternoon. Um, and uh, we'll be s hopefully starting tutoring um, this winter. We wanted to give kids a chance to kind of get used to the full three o'clock school day, um, but we have a lot of catch up to do with kids, and so we want to um, jump on that soon. And I think that's about it. We're right on, right on budget for where we are in the school year. I think that's it. Anybody got questions for Carrie?
Thank you, nope. Carrie. I, I will tell Carrie that great work with One Planet. It, it all all the things that she was saying really um, did a lot for families this this summer and, and that whole transition and and since. So I'm very happy we were able to do what we've done. So thank you. Agreed. Welcome. Thank you. White River Valley Food Friendly and Food Service. Hi, good evening, folks. I'm Bill Bonsignore. I've been working with your child nutrition directors uh, actually since way back in March uh, to provide meals to our kids, even during the shutdown. Uh, we also ran uh, the summer food service program through One Planet this summer uh, in a partnership with. Uh, Bill, Bill, I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't sorry. know if everyone here knows your actual official title and uh, how you're involved in the food business. We certainly didn't bring on a new person. So um, no, Bill, I, do you want to explain what you do? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the other administrator that works for, works with Carrie in, in running the, uh, the One Planet After School and Summer Learning Program. And part of the reason I ended up with the food service piece is that I've, I've run the Summer Food Service Program uh, through One Planet for the last five years. So nothing necessarily special other than I've had the experience with the program and experience of how the program works and and the compliance pieces of it so it was a bit of a natural fit for me to to try to help these folks folks out so um, as we were all trying to figure out the craziness that has been covid this was one of the places where where work intersected and it made sense that that i start working with these folks a little bit and, and helping them out but my official title is uh, Assistant Director of the One Planet Program. So we continued uh, we continued uh, food service through, through the summer. We actually had a nice partnership with Stagecoach out of Randolph. They actually did a lot of delivery of our meals. Uh, we did something we've never done before. We operated programs in at at all eight of our schools. Normally, we just do the programs at the six summer camps we run. We have uh, Rochester and Stockbridge and Chelsea and Tunbridge are both combined camps. And so usually we only offer food at the sites where we're having camp, but this year we expanded it. So we were able to offer, offer food, breakfast and lunch to all our communities through summer. This emergency order stayed on and they, we continue to operate the summer food service program. The nice part about it is we get a higher reimbursement rate than we do through the regular program that we use, which is called the national school lunch program. And we will be continuing in this program for the rest of the year. And we're hoping that um, this, this can help us out, as I said in my report, in a number of areas. Uh, when your sites are operating the fresh fruit and vegetable uh, grant program, where kids get fresh fruits and vegetables and some learning and nutritional objectives every day. That's happening at their schools. Uh, you can see sort of where we are, um, you know, meal total wise there, you know, 23,000 plus breakfast, 30,000 plus lunches. We're approaching the $200,000 mark for reimbursements this year. Um, some of the things the uh, your child nutrition directors wanted um, to come back to, just uh, thinking about uh, a more streamlined debt collections procedure. We're working on that in red pretty heavy right now with uh, with Nisha and, and the principals and Scott Putney to uh, to get that, get that settled. Um, and they, one of the things they were also talking about was was seeing if they could get a little bit more professional development time uh, to uh, to just get better at their jobs. Some of the things that um, you know, Jamie, Taryn, I want us to talk with you folks about uh, just as we move forward. You've got a really good group of people. We have been reaching out to other food service programs as well as the state uh, for counsel and for information. We've had some meetings with other uh, food service uh, or child nutrition directors. Uh, in different locations in the state about how they do things. We're continuing to learn, we're continuing to grow. One of the things we did want to talk with you folks about is for compliance reasons, for financial reasons, for efficiency reasons, you know, we'd like to suggest a consideration that we do a rearrangement and perhaps pull uh, child nutrition programs underneath, underneath the SU. This would allow us, um, we believe just, just to operate the programs you know, better holistically. So um, just wanted so to that, make sure that. That will be on the agenda for January. 
um, and for us to discuss the pros and cons. And I, we don't really need to make any decisions around that because it's an enterprise fund until February. So that doesn't affect your budgeting purposes in the SU. But I do think we need to weigh whether or not this is an appropriate step to consider for potential savings in uh, menu planning across the SU, uh, bulk purchasing, um, trying to play off each other's strengths. And we look around the expertise across our kitchens across the SU. And I got to say, Bill's done a great job coordinating folks this year. Um, they're meeting on a regular basis now, and that's new. I mean, you know, there's a lot of pluses to COVID that weren't anticipated. And I think many of them is the fact that folks have become a lot more comfortable with technology. So our ability now to pull our food service workers together on a regular basis is much uh, more significant than it was in the past where we would be asking them all to drive to a location. And so participation in our meetings across the SU has gone up significantly due to the leverage of technology. So again, this was just to start you thinking about it, know that it'll be a discussion item as we move forward and something that we're gonna need to chew on when we have more time um, when we get into the numbers and potential savings. And I know it's not the first time you've had these conversations. I don't know if anybody has any questions or they think we do address, but I'm happy to do my best to answer those if you have them. Any questions, anyone? All right. Um, Thank you, Bill. Um, River Valley VLA. Principal Stetson. Yes. Um, so Jamie asked me to just write up something, and it's very simple in comparison. I'll work on getting it in um, our normal format here for next month. Uh, just kind of as an update, we've made it through the first trimester of the Virtual Learning Academy. Um, K through eight, there were 123 kids who completed the first trimester um, from start to finish. So uh, they also all received in K through six, we piloted a uh, proficiency-based uh, report card for mathematics and literacy. And Amy Toth and I worked on that together and Amy was very supportive in helping roll that out with uh, teachers as well, because that was something new for teachers. Um, we've offered up to parents and we're gonna establish a night for like question and answer about the grading process around proficiencies, because just as it's um, new for a lot of folks, it's especially different to read it as a parent um, as well. And that was the majority of our focus. So those have all gone out. Um, students have access to pretty much all the essentials classes. There are live music and library classes happening K through five. And then there are our activities uh, sent out every week. So it's not a screen-based activity. The goal is to keep kids off the computer a little bit for something like art. Uh, we are working with the Arts Bus who has agreed to help put together arts kits to get out to those students so they have access to more materials. Um, two, three, our 2-3 two, three virtual class had a very successful and enjoyable uh, virtual field trip to Billings Farm last week. And um, I actually met with our teacher Monica Farrington afterwards and she highly recommended that all all classes do that and she shared out a bunch of different resources of how to access because it's something even in-person classes could do in January and she said it was a lot of fun and a great way to build on some science activities um, what else here uh, students in grades six through eight, as we've started second trimester, are doing a inquiry-based learning project specifically on science. Um, and they seem to have really enjoyed that so far and actually are asking me to up the pace of that because they'd like to do more on that, um, probably more so than some other things. And the all the virtual learning staff participated in yesterday, or today is in service, excuse me, I'm a day ahead of myself and will tomorrow, and actually several of our virtual learning 
staff members um, actually joined our SUDS math in service today to really work on their math instruction because I had observed several math virtual learning math classes last week and we had really talked about our language and how specific we are with our instruction in math because sometimes that's where some of the confusion in lies for kids. So it was great to have them join us for that. And I think that's it. I'm sure there's a lot more, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Lindy. Yes. Um, how is the math instruction going? Um, in what I have observed, it's definitely one of the harder transitions from in person. Uh, just in the past week since I spoke to you last, Bob, um, it's definitely one of the harder uh, forms of instruction to transition from in person to virtual, just in terms of using manipulatives, making sure you can see what students are doing, their thought process, how to share that. I've seen some great strategies from like, I almost just did it and then you would have saw my keyboard moving your um, camera down so the teacher can watch what kids are writing while they're doing it so they can see their thought process but a lot of um, the instruction I have seen so far is uh, no different than what I see in person in that our language as instructors is what is causing some of the confusion in mathematics so an example is I watched a lesson on place value in estimation last week and there were kids who definitely got the concepts I could see it I could hear it in their answers their explanations um, what was confusing is when we got to larger numbers and the instructor was not specific or explicit in what place value to use which made it all that more confusing for the kids to try and decipher what step they should use or where they should start. So because that language wasn't there from the get-go, um, it made it, it, there were kids that had missteps and they needed to be backed up and we needed to reteach and re-explain. And that's something I see in person as well. Our language as instructors is what frequently causes uh, misinformation or mislearning in math and books. Does a teacher use a whiteboard in front of the computer screen? I've seen three different strategies so far. I've seen there's an actual, and you can even, don't click too far, but you can actually see the tool if you are on a meet under the three dots. There is this thing called a whiteboard. It's at the very top. Um, I'd encourage you at some point, it's gonna open a different tab if you click on it now. Just a heads up, but it is a tool that a teacher can use and everybody gets on at the same time. It's kind of like a Google Doc, but it has more tools that can be used um, to build things like circles and triangles or do your fractions. So I've seen that uh, instructional tool use. I've seen like the mini whiteboards where teachers write on it or demonstrate or build with manipulatives on it. And then I've just seen chart paper. So I've seen those three strategies at this point for instruction. Lindy, I'd like to thank you for being involved in curriculum. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I really enjoy it. It's a great way to see kids. I've, I've learned a lot, too. Um, I will be the first one to admit, and if Bonnie Bourne were on here, she would shame me for saying this, but math is something that tends to give me anxiety, especially if we get to the fraction level. And she'll say that's because of the instruction I received. Um, mm -hmm. So I try, <laughs> I try to, and, and I'm pretty sure that's why every example she gave today when we were analyzing our instruction was around fractions to make me feel more comfortable <laughs> as we were learning uh, together and teaching together. But um, it's definitely been fun to learn and be a part of. And I really, really enjoy it. How are kids doing, you know, in this virtual learning? Academically, I think they're doing well. I um, will always say that my concern virtually is the social emotional piece. And for some kids, especially with the current restrictions, like there's no rec sports, there's no getting together in your 
you know, closest COVID bubble uh, friend group right now. Um, I'm, I'm concerned socially, emotionally. We've tried to put things like lunch bunches into place and some other things where they can just get together and interact. Um, but that's one major difference or need I see uh, in kids, you know, the difference between working with in-person kiddos and uh, the virtual learning academy kiddos is they're craving more time together with kids their own age, even if it's only through a screen. Academically, are they grade level? Um, I think so. I'm curious and excited to see, you know, start testing to get some firm assessment data behind that. If we've seen some great growth in, um, I can specifically speak to fifth grade uh, literacy, just because I've seen that data more recently. That teacher did some running records before we went on vacation. And most of those kiddos have moved right along just as much as those um, that are in person. So at a very quick rate, and a majority are meeting this standard or above this standard for this point in the year. Lindy, I was curious if uh, you're getting enough engagement and support at the family level from those families involved with kids with, virtual, with the Remote Learning Academy, and um, if there are any issues with technology or if those have all been sorted out. Um, so in terms of engagement level, we, I would say we have a really high engagement level. I, I was shocked, um, especially considering the spring and, you know, kind of what seemed like a little bit of, uh, chasing some families around those for the most part, um, those who have committed to this, have committed to this pretty much every level there is, um, you know, of course that looks really different if your child is in kindergarten or first grade than it does if you have a middle schooler. Um, Cause it's not just your kid committing, it's like you committing as well and making sure that they're sitting and paying attention um, at some of the younger grade levels. But for the most part, it's doing really well. We did send home with report cards if we were concerned about some kids who hadn't engaged either attendance wise and or lack of evidence of learning jamie and i did send a letter that said we're not really sure this is working you need to establish a meeting with the two of us to talk about how this can change um and that was i was just counting that was sent out of 123 families that was sent to 10 households so that's pro it's not bad it's not great we always want everybody um, in terms of technology, the biggest hurdles were at the beginning. We definitely have overcome that, and families have figured out ways um, to kind of work around that. Uh, when there are problems, they communicate with teachers, reset up times. If, you know, the internet's down in the morning, they set up a time to meet with the teacher in the afternoon. So there's some flexibil flexibility around that. Um, I would say the only other panic that occurred, and poor Ray and Jamie can attest to this, is 7.30 Monday morning when Google was just not working. <laughs> uh, so that, it, thankfully it was back up by 7.45, but um, that did give us uh, the think time to think like we need to make sure that virtual learning is its own group that we can do a robot call to and say, hey, we understand this is happening. Everybody, here's how we're gonna adjust and move forward, so. Um, for the most part, I would say the technology hurdles we've overcome and, um, you know, no different than your cell phone. The kids can actually teach you quite a bit too. <laughs> it's what I've learned. Thanks a lot. I know that you, like many, did not sign up for this necessary part of the job. So thank well, you. Thank you. It's actually been a lot of fun. I get to, I start my day every day with the middle school group, the six, seven, and eight. We do morning meeting together. And I was sharing with the principals. They're just an amazing group of kids. And it's really fun to be connected with kids from other buildings, SU wide. So it's been great. Lynn, you have a question? This is a tough one, probably. Um, How would you compare the learning that the sixth grade 
math students have had compared to that which would happen in face face every class in the rochester so i have to be honest i'm slightly biased because the sixth grade uh math teacher for virtual learning is also the sixth grade math teacher in stockbridge so i happen to know a little bit more <laughs> and get to see the differences you know in person versus um versus uh virtually i would say in in particular with the sixth grade group they are getting everything and probably more than in person because the makeup of that group wants more they are a math oriented uh group they really enjoy math so they're like pushing for more um which is great and they also i would say means they move at a pace that's pretty comparable to what's going on in person sometimes there's things don't happen necessarily as quickly as what's going on in person it's not that kids aren't getting the same it's just the pacing slightly different um that's not the case with sixth grade math i would say in other grade levels bob it it's not that it's not comparable, they're still getting the same information. It's just not quite at the pace as if they were in person because it takes a little bit longer and needs more time to do some checks for understanding to make sure kids are really grasping the knowledge. Good, sounds good. Any other questions for Lindy? Thank you, Lindy. Thank you guys. Um, discussion items, White River Valley SU audit. Tara, do you just want to give an update on where we're currently at with the audit? The auditors are in the process of wrapping up for the first draft of the SU and the RUD FY20 audits. Um, as of last week, we are still on target to have those reports end of this month, early January. So once I have any further information, we'll let you all know. They've been here and completed all their work. So we're just waiting on the drafts. Nice. Tara, this is Don. I had thought that when we entered into our last agreement with the auditors, we were supposed to get these earlier. Is that not accurate? I believe the original agreement was to have them by December. Am, am I misremembering? And we don't have them yet, right? Not quite? Not quite yet. Okay. The additional news I'll give you, Don, based on speaking with Tara and the auditors, uh, is that we shouldn't see multiple drafts this time. Rose worked really hard um, to make certain that the numbers the auditors received were really solid numbers. So they don't expect for multiple drafts to be had. So that's positive, but I agree. You know, the expectation is as we move forward that we'd have those for December one. Um, that would be the goal. Is well, that have last year. Go, go ahead, Lee. Please. Oh, I was just going to ask if that December one date was in a contract or in a in a document in writing somewhere, or if that was just a verbal agreement. December one was definitely communicated. Um, okay. You know, part of it that held this up, and why we're about a month behind was us getting our information finalized. But you know. They were, they did receive their information right around December 1, all the documentation they needed. And then they were on site like December 10th that week, Tara. Maybe it was like, was it the 10th? They were here in yeah. November and then they were here last or two weeks ago doing yeah. their, the single audit for the federal portion of it. So. I mean, we're just I, waiting. It's it's ahead of where we were um, last year. I think they were still in our office auditing at that point. So hopefully it moves along quickly now and we get the numbers we're waiting for. They indicated that there, there won't be, they think that the projections that we gave you in August, correct me if I'm wrong, Tara, 
are fairly accurate. I asked that question, I know Tara did. So I'm feeling like the numbers you saw are pretty close with that projected deficit of DSU. Okay. Um, anything else on audit, guys? And in case you were wondering, we did the two largest entities first because the rest of them should go fairly quickly, right? We get the SU out of the way. Part of what held us up last year a bit was is that they did your districts and then they did the SU audit and had to adjust all your local district audits. So that's why we've tackled the SU first. Okay. Anything else for audits, guys? All right. We'll move on to 21-22 budget. Tara, you want to roll this out? Sure. So I'm going to start with the, the central office budget first. And it's a slightly different format than what you saw last year. We still, that's the SPED budget, Ray. There you go, thanks. So it's still grouped together based on function. The top one was a program that was in place back in 1920 that we took out in the 2021 budget and continue to have it out in the 21-22 budget. The next section down under curriculum, that is the function for currently was Mary Ellen and will in the future be our chief academic officer. I believe I used the right title, Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong. So that section of the budget is based on a projected salary that we think we will be able to hire someone in that position for. And then the benefits, supply lines and professional development that goes along with the needs of that position. The next section down is the technology. So this here, you're going to see we have a large change in this portion of the budget. And the reason for that being, I believe we've talked about it a couple of times, is we are moving Ray's technology support team to the central office rather than being in your local district budgets. And you've all seen that already in your local district budget, the difference there for the budgeted funds. So that is moving all of them here to us. The next section down is the office of the superintendent. Not any major changes there. The preschool coordinator, that is um, for, the, for Jan, who is our preschool coordinator. She works with all of our preschool programs, both internally and externally, and also through our Winooski Valley Association that we are a part of that collaborative for preschools. That portion is also um, offset by Title IIA funding. And then the next section is for my team and the audits for each of the member districts. So that's our side. And then the big change there you'll see is that increase in the software to cover our lease and the annual maintenance contract that we have to pay for Infinite Visions. The next section down is central office, and this is primarily just the entire function of the central office outside of the individual departments within. We have added $25,000 here for our building consultant. Um, several of you have heard reports from Lyle, and he will continue to work with us and our building and maintenance staff to come up with our maintenance plans, identify areas that need to be addressed immediately based on both our VISBIT security and safety audits and also um, just general repairs and maintenance and coming up with transition plans for each of our building facilities teams. I removed the HRA that I discussed earlier. That was the original deposit that we no longer need to fund for. And then the next section, instructional salary. This is new to the budget this year. Uh, this is for our pre-K literacy math intervention. This position is fully funded by Title I. It hadn't been identified in the expenditure budget, so we've added it this year. 
but you will see on the revenue side that it is offset by Title I revenues. The next section was the grant administration section that we have removed moving forward. And then lastly, the district wide, that was the other team members of the curriculum team that Jamie discussed with you earlier this year that we have now removed that were also funded by uh, federal funds. So overall, the total expenditure budget for the SU is up $84,108 or 4.88%. 77,000 of that is the addition of the pre-K literacy math interventionist position. So overall, the supervisory union budget without that position was up just over $7,000 or 0.411%. Any questions on the expenditure side of the SU budget before we move on? to the revenue side. Any questions? Uh, so I just, I just wanted to highlight real quick that we thought it was really important to include all of our intervention uh, staff in here and that Sue's worked for you for a long time and she is directly um, supported via the grant, but she's a position that we think is important and that should be part of the expenditure. Um, if for some yeah. reason the grant didn't come through, we would still keep her in place. And so hence she is at a, uh, a budgeted expenditure, um, just like we would keep, you know, the chief academic officer in place. We're gonna use some title funds for that position but we need that position. And so we're budgeting corresponding revenue, but I just wanted you to know that that's a position you've had for a long time. Um, and so I think that that $7,000 figure is something for you to just to, to think about um, in regards to what we actually increased um, dollar for dollar. Um, for things like that, would it be possible to put notes to Again, oh yeah, the, we, when we do your packets, I mean, part of my job, Ethan, just like in all your local district budgets as we've recoded things and the idea of like moving technology to the SU so that we can better coordinate those efforts in regards to Ray, which you've seen that line increase significantly. But of course it's got decrease in expenditures locally. We're gonna communicate all of that um, in your books and within the SU budget. That's why that narrative will be so important. Jamie, what's the budget? Figure, what's that? What's the budget figure you're using? Is that with the cuts this year, or without the cuts, or what is it? This is with the proposed cuts. Yeah, but what's the budget figure that you're using? Last year's original budget? No, we built this budget from what we're proposing for next year. Bob, I think I think you, Bob. I think you're looking. They they started from scratch. They started from yeah. Zero. I know that. Yeah, I know that. But uh, what are you comparing? What are you comparing to? Just the the positions that are there right now. Well, we're comparing to what you have budgeted in 2021 to what we're proposing you budget for 21 22, which okay. has restructuring in it. Um, and we're proposing that you move technology to the SU because it'll allow us to better coordinate operations and a reminder that then you'll see those expenditures decrease locally and that will become part of your SU assessment. I don't know if that helps Bob or not. Wow. And this is just one piece of it. We're gonna show you the special ed side next. I just want to know if you're using if you're using the budget that it was in the town report. You yeah, know, this 2021 budget was what was in the town report. Okay. All right. That's all. Yeah, sorry. Yep. I I see what you're saying, Bob. You're asking was it the budget that we currently are projecting? No. This 2021 you're seeing is what the board last year and in the town report. Okay. Carol, can you give 
I don't know. I'm not mine. Um, can you give me that percentage number um, again when if you pull out um, the uh, positions that are uh, funded by title funds, what you had just given with that bottom percentage? 0. 0.411. 0.411. Okay, thank you. Um, I really appreciate that, that we're we're. I, I really think that it's 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 much more transparent to to show all the salaries that that we pay, whether they're grant funded or locally funded. Um, I th I think that's some sometimes where we got bit in the in, in the backside in the past was you know there were these things that we weren't really reporting because. We they, they they were completely off our books in a way they were they were completely grant funded so I, I I applaud doing that and I also applaud the honesty in saying that you know once we hire someone if their grant funding goes away chances are we're still gonna gonna keep them in in, in some some way way shape or form and I don't know what but what I'd like to see and I think would be helpful and I'm not sure if it should be part of the narrative or part of this document or a standalone document a document that 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 shows a person their their FTE and their percentage of, of, of grant funding because like we have the, the 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 preschool salary person that's there uh, we've added and I'm not sure I, I don't remember if that was I, I want to say I don't think that person's a full FTE or not but again having a reference to to understand when I'm looking at, 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 an, at, an, at an item that says preschool coordinator that it tells me this person is is 0.6 and they're 75% grant funded, or this person is 0.1 and they're 100% locally funded. That would be really kind of helpful to understand all the, number one, all the players, and number two, uh, all the funding. That is a document that Cynthia has actually created for us, so that will be easy for us to incorporate, Carl. Thank you. Terry, do you want to continue into special ed? And then we'll take additional questions and then show folks the revenue page and what we're projecting for assessments. Yep. So under the special education, again, we're comparing it to the FY 2021 budget. The top section is for our triple E, which is early English. Am I saying it wrong? Don. <laughs> Early essential um, education. Thank you. I always use the wrong E's for that. Uh, so we made changes based on current staffing and benefit needs, as well as made some adjustments to contracted services based on what we're currently using and what we project to use moving forward in the next fiscal year. We took out idea B pre-K because we don't have any students that are utilizing that portion at this time and don't expect to have any next year. So you'll see that that's all been removed. Also along that same lines, the triple E SLP, which is the speech language, that's also been removed because we do not have any current or projected needs for that section of the budget, as well as the occupational therapist. So those you'll see are all removals in the special education budget based on current and future projections. The next section is based on special education direct instruction. We've made updates to the teachers and the support staff salaries based on current staffing and projected staffing needs in the future. Took out any changes that needed to be made as far as FICA and benefits as a result of those staffing changes and retirement contributions. There's also a reduction in contracted services for that section based on utilization now and in the future. And then you'll see there's been some small cuts throughout the travel and supply lines. Idea B, proportionate share. Uh, we've kept that to that as well. Yep. Um, can you scoop back up to the top of the document, please? The proposed budget was 128 for the first for 2021 and 21 22 is 14 uh, 114 that's that's not a difference of 242,000 nope, I don't know mine has negatives so I don't know what happened in that version so I will resend this to you okay thank you and that's going to reflect down below as well I yeah think. the number on the bottom is right the 31 444 is accurate I don't know why the 
top section is showing. It looks like they add, the columns are added yeah, rather yeah, than added. Okay. But yeah, the bottom number is in fact accurate. That is what mine shows, a reduction of 31,444. And then uh, down below, there's a couple of other entries that were added rather than subtracted. Okay. I will go back and double check those, Don. Thank you. All right. All right, I lost my place. All right, so we are down to idea B, tuition. We've left that as budgeted previously. Then the special education psychological services. This adjustment here is for our restorative classroom, which I believe has been renamed. Um, but that is moving the staff from above to here where they'll actually be allocated as far as what their expenditures are. And then the next section is the special education speech language. So this is for uh, the remaining services that are provided outside of the triple E. So just a few small adjustments throughout those, that line item. And then we made the adjustments under the occupational therapy that needed to be made. Again, they're not substantial changes, a few changes here and there. And then other support services, we made some adjustments based on current usage and projections for the future. And same for instructional staff trainings. And then the special education admin salaries, this is based on the, the salaries and benefits of the special education administrative team here at the central office. And the big change there that you'll see Last year, it appears that all of the admin and support salaries were all coded up underneath the admin salaries. And this year, we've actually broken them out to be reflective of what where they were, the con admin versus support staff. And then the health insurance adjustments, FICA adjustments as necessary for changes that were made. And then the rest of it is pretty much funded status quo throughout the remainder of the budget. With the big exception down here, the contracted transportation, um, we did increase that based on current needs. So overall, the special education budget is up $70,613 or 0.88%. So, um, you know, we, we worked really hard to try to keep both sides under that 1% increase, um, as we told you that we were going to set out to do across the districts and the SU. Um, you know, Don and I have met with Tara several times now, I believe three, that make certain we've worked this out fully. Um, we believe that this amount budgets for the expenditures that we're going to incur next year, it's conservative and responsible. Um, you know, what we're not going to want to do is be coming back to you in October saying we're projecting a deficit. So we believe this is the resources needed um, to provide the special education services we need to throughout the SU. It also, just so you know, does take and shift resources to build that 9 through 12 intensive programming with the idea being that we can start to pull some students back tuition-wise, but if you look at tuitions, we still budgeted tuitions, um, not assuming that those students will all come back. So know that we were conservative there. So I don't want you thinking we gambled on tuitions. We didn't. We knew we were building the program. The idea would be that we'll incur additional savings as we go, but we didn't budget thinking that we were gonna just pull students back ASAP. Right, we knew that would take a little time. Um, and the idea would be that too, we ensure that we're not having students leave. Speaking of time, what were you thinking of a time frame to build that special ed 912? Well, there's been planning already occurring um, and we're gonna look to use um, regular ed staffing. The RUD budget supports regular ed staffing to push in to provide instruction to those students 9 through 12. Yeah. Um, students in the SU are placed in that type of setting, 9 through 12, they will be RUD students because they're our high school, right? 9 through 12. Yeah. So the least restrictive environment, 
makes sense to be that program, the Wildcat Institute, then they would be RUD students. So therefore, RUD is budgeting appropriately to provide instructional staff to support those students. And what we've done is we've taken our staffing in K through two, and we've transitioned that staffing into K through two restorative program to staff the nine through 12. I thought one of the sticking points was finding space. Has that space been found? It has. Okay. Right. And it'll be housed right at the high school campus. Okay. All right, questions, anyone? I don't know when the time is to talk about this, but I think it might be now, but maybe it's done on the, on the next one. And that is that one of my concerns about passing the SU and the special ed budget at this point in time is that once they're passed, um, if our budgets don't pass, then we we don't have any ability to make any more cuts um, to you. And uh, I know that FBUD and Strafford were put in that position uh, last year. And I, <clears throat> I don't feel a, a whole lot more positive going into a town, uh, annual district meeting this year and, and you know, with a budget um, and property taxes, you know, going up. And so, I just, I have a hard time uh, approving these when um, ours might not get approved. And then we, then the only place that we can cut from and on our budget is the K through eight portion of our budget, which is 9% of the budget. And so um, you need to help me with that one because <laughs> I, I can't, I'm having a hard time um, I'm going to have a hard time voting. Yes, not because I don't think it's fair, but because I don't know I, the ripple down effect is going to be um, difficult. I think I can. I hear that too, Sarah. Especially considering it took us so long to get our budgets to pass, and people just received their second tax bill in Tumbridge, and the receiving of that has not been very happy. <laughs> Um, Merry so, Christmas. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas. So I think um, March is going to be, or whenever we have a vote, is going to be a very, very uphill battle no matter what we do. Um, so I, but I, I don't know how I feel about it either, but I, I know we passed this ahead of, of even talking to our, our boards about it. Yeah. Jamie, is there any state requirements that the supervisory union budget be passed before the individual district budgets are passed? It, I don't know if it's in statute. I mean, the practice is, is that you would adopt this budget so you have real numbers because otherwise you're going to be adjusting your numbers after the voters pass it, right? And so without the SU budget being passed, in theory, the SU board could then decide to increase the budget after the voters already passed a budget, right? And so practice is always that the SU board would adopt a formal budget and then you know what that assessment is so the voters can budget, you know, the voters can vote accordingly. Right. Can we adjust, can we, do we have the ability as a board to reopen the budget if like all our budgets go down? <laughs> Or, you know, and yes, you, I mean, I would certainly entertain that. I mean, I want us to be as interdependent as possible, right? I mean, the idea of you approving this, you know, the, the concept to me is to ensure you have real numbers to go to your voters. Lisa, Lisa had a question, but the one thing I would say is that because we were not the majority, Sarah, that didn't get budgets passed. So that doesn't help us if the majority of this board is okay with where it's at or can live with it. It, there was no help for us in August, so um, that I would say that would be a tricky thing. But go ahead, Lisa. <clears throat> I just wanted to say um, we've had a challenging few go arounds. I mean, two years ago we had to revote our budget; um, it passed, but then there was a petition to revote it and um, it passed again. Um, so it's not always been easy, and we have had deficits for the last few years, and that's been a challenge. What I really 
appreciate about this budget cycle is that we're able to see where there are savings. It doesn't feel like it's just spending, spending, spending. And I feel like I can defend this budget because we're, we're, we have a, a system at the supervisory union. I'm sorry, I'm not being terribly articulate. We have systems at the supervisory union that have an eye toward where we can save money, but still provide what we need to for our students. And we're finally getting real answers to the questions that I feel like we've been asking for a long time. I, I feel like I've had this gnawing feeling in my stomach that something wasn't right, but nobody's been able to tell me what wasn't right until the last few months. And I am so incredibly appreciative of that. Our White River Unified District budget um, is looking pretty conservative and I really appreciate that and I appreciate this budget um, and how conservative it looks right now too. And I also want to build our budget with real numbers. I, I don't want to be building a budget based on, I, I don't know, based on something that feels a lot fluffier than what we have right now. So um, that's just my two cents and I know that it's challenging I followed in the news, you know, how your budgets went, and I have a lot of empathy for that too. So it's just my my thoughts. Can I, Lisa, I would totally agree with everything you said. Um, the, the point I'm trying to, you know, is that um, it takes a huge amount of our budget out of our ability to, out of our reach, basically. And it does the same for you too. And um, you know, I don't know what, I mean, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball and I don't, I don't know what's going to happen in March or whenever it does happen. Um, but I also have a problem that the only kids that get affected in our, in our district anyway, when we have to cut the budget is the K through eight kids. That's what that's that's you know that's the only part we can we can we have any effect on at all uh, because we don't have a high school because we tuition out um, and so I just like to have that door a little bit more open and if there's you know I mean and um, you know maybe there's no reason to and maybe maybe Stratford's will pass and yours won't you know or or maybe everybody will pass and you know I, I don't know but that's the only thing that 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 is in the back of my mind on that and i would totally echo everything you said about the quality of the budgets that are being put forward and the and the transparency and the accuracy and that you know at least we're dealing with real numbers and we don't have you know fluff and or whatever you want to call it um so i totally agree with that and this this comment is not around that at all I hope you you hear that it's just around, um, you know, it's eight percent or nine percent of our budget last year was was the only thing that we had any control on, and that's not a lot. And the, and so if there's a big cut put out, um, you know, if there's a big cut, or if the budget just goes down, that's you know anyway. I hear and echo what you're saying, Sarah, but I also hear what Lisa's saying. And I know we need this number to know what to build into our budgets even. Like we can't build a budget without knowing the number. Um, and I, I appreciate the FBUD budget that came to us a couple weeks ago. It was um, a better number than we've seen in a really long time um, to, to feel like taking to our voters, although I don't think 0% is going to pass this year the way I'm hearing people talking right now. But um, uh, I, I mean, I think you guys did a great job on what you gave us for numbers. I'd like to make a motion. <laughs> okay, go ahead. That if two, that if two budgets in the district go down, that we open up the supervisor union budget for discussion. I can support that. Second. Um, it's not something we've ever done before. How do people, uh, do I have a second to that? Yep. 
I do. Okay. Do we have discussion on the motion? Um, I've got a question. So let's sure. say a let's say a board doesn't approve a budget. They're operating on I think it was like eighty five percent of what the previously passed budget was. Does the SU assessment get taken? Does that affect the SU assessment, or do they have to play the full SU assessment and they have eighty five percent of what the you know whatever their total budget was? But they have to pay the full SU assessment. Yeah, correct. Eighty-seven percent. Okay. Yep. Um, hi, oops. Hi there. My, this is Sue. Whoops. I'm sorry. I I didn't know you. For, sorry about that. Keep going. <laughs> my other comment would be, you know, as far as our local district budgets go, like once we've passed a budget, you know, we're not going to approve raising the budget because you know then we're basically just putting ourselves in a de deficit. But the SU, like, I mean, this year we're not replacing a couple of positions, so we have some SU office. And theoretically, if you haven't passed your budget yet and we project those savings, you can decrease your SU assessment by that much without, you know, officially changing the budget or whatever, because you know that there's going to be some projected savings that you can pass into your local budget. You just, you know, the the towns that have already passed the budget would get a surplus from a lowered SU assessment and the towns that didn't wouldn't. So, you know, even if we've passed the budget, you can still do this sorts of things. I think you can still do this sort of thing in your local SU assessment budget, perhaps. Does that make sense? No, I don't think we can do anything in our local SU assessment. Well, I mean, you basically what you're putting into your budget is what you were projecting your SU assessment to be, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we make that number smaller, which I don't think there's any reason we couldn't in our local budget make the number smaller than what's passed or larger than what's passed, it just gives you a deficit or a surplus at the end of the year if it's different from what actually comes in. Correct, it, so we would know, be deficit spending. Well, it's just a line in your budget. I, I. I mean, I'd need to verify this, but my guess is that there's nothing in statute that says that that number has to match what the past budget is. Like you can change it in your local budget. It's stupid to, unless you know that there's gonna be savings or you know there's gonna be excess spending. So what I'm saying is, you know, let's say we have a past SU budget, a whole bunch of deficit or boards going to don't get their board things passed. Jamie, finds like somebody, there's a couple of positions we don't fill at the SU office, so we're projecting savings. You could lower that SU assessment without having to go through voting an approved budget. Um, and then if the savings come through, you don't wind up with the deficit at the end. Does that make sense? I mean, it, I don't have any problem with opening if people are, um, you know, if if there's a situation where we want to revisit the um, budget after it's been passed, I just don't know how that, that's going to work. Um, you know, okay. other than just like because the towns have already passed their the other towns have already passed their budgets, and so their lines are fixed. Like their SU assessment lines are already fixed. And if we then change the overall SU, well, I guess it's the same thing, whatever. <laughs> All right. So, Don, Sue had her hand up, and then I'll go to you. Sue Kay? Are you there, Sue? Yeah, hi there, Kathy. Sorry. Okay. So, my question no, no to Bob is like, it took us three times to pass a budget, but we did. So which budget are you referring to? Because I know Tunbridge is famous for failing the budget, but then sometimes coming back and improving even more money than originally asking for. So I think your motion has to include their, what budget is finally passed. I don't think you can just say the budget failed because sometimes it turns around and the next one passes and it's not that much different from the first one. So I, I think it's a, I think it's a little short sighted to say just because it fails, two of them fail, you know we have to go back to the SU. I think it needs to have a lot more depth to it. 
fails by a certain percentage, the new budget that comes back is, is a, you know, lower by a certain percent, because I do not think it's fair to say just because it didn't pass the first time. Good point. Don? Well, my point sort of echoes, Susan, that there could be other reasons that budgets don't pass other than uh, monetary. It could be political pressures. It could be other assortment of causes that uh, make it go down. And so I, I think it's uh, something to question. Don, I couldn't agree with you more because if, if you watch the papers, the FBUD, a lot of it doesn't have to do with the budget. It has to do with the merger. And so is it fair to hold the rest of the SU accountable because it may not even be the budget as much as the, as the feeling towards this merger. And we're holding the whole SU hostage because of it. So I've got to say, I'm not, I'm not in favor of the motion, but I, it, just my, my opinion. Okay, do we want to amend the motion or do we want to vote on it as it is right now? Kathy, Carl's had his hand up for a few minutes. Oh, sorry, Carl, I missed that. That's, that's okay. Um, I was going to e echo what Don said. Our budget was voted down um, not for dollars. Um, well, it was voted down for dollars, but it was voted down for dollars because we still had a high school building that, that uh, we hadn't managed we, we hadn't managed to uh, make magically disappear. Um, so it, it, it really wasn't you know it, it really wasn't a, a, a vote because of just the overall cost of spending. And as far as Andrew's point goes, I'm not sure what kind of teeth there is, but I think, I mean, and, and what we're supposed to do in terms of the honesty or the, 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 the not honesty, because I mean, it sounds like we're deliberately lying, but the, 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 the fluffing of the numbers, so to speak, because, you know, I, I don't know what sort of in, in, uh, penalties there are around, you know, I mean, no town would ever have to go into the penalty. They could just decide that magically their budget uh, was below the, the 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 penalty threshold, and then just run a deficit, and uh, uh, you know just just constantly avoid paying that. So I don't know what the con what the whether there's any way that that uh, you know the, the 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 state or the AOE can can say that your budget's just off base. But I'm not sure that you know I, I I'm not sure that we can really really play fast and loose. And the last piece is just in my community, I think that if I tried to present a, a, a town budget that didn't have the, uh, um, you know, a, a firm, you know, rock solid SU number in it, my town would probably, my voters would probably vote it down because they'd say, we're, we're giving them a blank check. We we're just going to, we're going to write a check and then we'll, we'll pay whatever, you know, we're going to pass a budget with just uh, an estimate or a guesstimate or whatever of what the SU costs are rather than something that's fixed. And, 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 you know, we, we, we hope the SU doesn't, doesn't exceed. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think I see <clears throat> both sides to this. I think, Sue, that we're going to be up against it a little more because of budget numbers this year, just because of the second tax bill that went out. People are really angry about mm -hmm. the amount of the budget and it not going down. But we do have a good budget that we have to present with F. But I, I would, I'm going to support the SU budget because. Uh, Kathy, I on that, that, I just wanted to say people are upset with, uh, you know, the new tax bill, but do they recognize the fact it wasn't last year's taxes that they originally got billed for? It was 87% of what the budget would have been. So right. they're thinking I think it's, we need to have a, yeah, they're, I think they're we need to have a signed conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a lot that, yeah. And that's why I say I don't support this because there's a lot of stuff in each community that the SU budget should not be affected by. All right, guys. So we have a motion on the table. It's been seconded. Is there any other discussion? Any amendments to it? Would you read the amend would you read the motion back, please? Um, Bob, can you repeat your motion or do you have it written down? I don't have it written, but um if two schools but if two schools budgets fail, we'll open up the central office budget for discussion. If two sorry, Bob, I'm taking minutes. If two district can I say district budgets instead of school budgets? Yeah, that'll be good. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So you got that done? 
I know this has been okay. very hard. I've been in districts where this has happened, and people are really upset that they can't, um, you know, that their own students in their own schools, their budgets get cut, and the central office doesn't. And I, this just gives us an opportunity to open up the budget and uh, discuss it if it's cut. And South Ralton Bethel, uh, we own 42% of that budget. So Bob, your intent there is that in our budgets, in like the, the Stratford budget, in your South Royalton budget, would be a set figure for the SU budget. Right. Or and then we'd actually pass the SU budget. Right. And, and But what we would do is, if this budget, or if this motion passes, is that if two or more towns right. don't go, then we reopen the budget to look and see if there's places where we can cut in the SU and special ed budget. Is that I, understanding? I, I, I'm just, uh, the only interjection I'm going to have, the biggest difference of the SU budget versus yours is I don't have a lot of budget lines in regards to supplies or things of that nature that I can cut. So I can cut staff. But even in special ed, a big chunk of your SU budget is salary and benefits. And my only worry about this, and you can do it, just know that my ability to fulfill what you're hoping is much less in the fact that we have two districts that vote in May and contracts will have been out. So I just, as you're voting, I don't want folks to get frustrated come June. You know, when I'm coming to you saying, this is what I can do. And it's a bit limited because a big chunk of your SU assessment is salary and benefits. And there's not other lines that I can steal things from. Right. Yeah, I think, sorry, I know we want to vote on this, but I think that's part of my concern is that if this is only passed, if it's passed, then it's passed and allocated. If it's passed contingent on everybody's budget passing, then we can't allocate anything until everybody's budget passes. I mean, it feels like this is holding this budget hostage to everybody else passing theirs. It's just, I mean, I, <clears throat> I understand the principle of it, and I like the idea that we are emboldened to reopen it if we need to, but I don't know logistically if we can make it work. And I do want to just point out that um, our side does not vote until May. Yeah, neither does Granville and Hancock. So I, I think that, um, that the, our select board is meeting in town and I think if they allow us to, I think FBUD is gonna possibly try to go that route too. So um, I heard one other district was talking about it. So May might be, so that being said, that's more districts that are, are gonna have um, a late vote. I would call the vote. Okay. All right. So I'll go down through the list. Um, all those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Um, hold on. I'm trying to get my list up. I, so, John, you want me to help you? Kathy, you're yeah. Better. If you could. Yeah. Aaron Daughter. Hi. Amy Will. Nay. Andrew Jones. What's better Nay. about my tongue? Carl Groppy. Nay. Don Shaw. Nay. Lisa Floyd. Nay. Lisa McCrory. Lisa M, are you there? Abstain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Megan Payne. Nay. Mika Tucker. Nay. 
Michael Gray. Well, my dad said it, so I'll I'll say uh, I'll support it. Yeah, yay! Bye. Christmas is coming, Michael. <laughs> right, I know, I know. I hope that's noted in the minutes. Bob <laughs> Gray. It's recorded. <laughs> I vote in favor. Yes. Stacy Peters. Uh, nay. Susan K. Nay. Kathy Galuzzo. Yay. Did we tally that, folks? Yes. Is that everybody? Sarah, Sarah didn't vote. Sorry, I apologize, Sarah. I missed you. I vote yes. So the A's have one, two, three, four, five, six. The nays have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we have one abstention. So the nays have it. Yeah, I don't think Lisa's abstention counts because Andrew, Bob, and I are the voting members from oh, White River you. Unified. I missed that. Okay. Thank yep. So, um, so eight nay, six yes. So the nays have it. So, Kathy, this is Sue. I'd like to make the, a motion to accept the SU budget, budget as presented. Yeah. I'll a second. second. I'll second that. Is there any discussion on the motion? Did we want to? Uh, did we? Did we get through the revenue piece of it? I thought we I just just got to jump in and say, let's can I I show you guys the revenue. Okay. All right, go for it, Jamie. Sorry, is this should this motion stay on the table? This is the part where I guess we can discuss it. Okay. Yeah. We'll leave it under discussion. It was not seconded, was it? Yes, it was by, by Lisa what? Floyd. Okay. Ray, can you project or are you caught up in our set? There he is. Wrong one, Ray. Jerry. Sarah, you want to walk us through the the? Can you, can you open uh, the attachment right that says WRVSU FY twenty one twenty two SU assessment, please, Ray? There we go. Thank you. So the top section shows the historical information on your assessment for 19 20, 21 and the projected assessment for FY22, which is based on the chart down below. So you'll see the expenditure budget there is the $1,806,927. We expect to receive um, our indirect rate. If our percentage comes in, we'll continue to get that at the $24,000, uh, $2,000 in interest. We do not have any direct grant revenue, so that is zero. You'll see the Medicaid revenue, as we discussed earlier, we have dropped down to $180,000. And then we added in our EPSDT MAC funding, which is another pool of money from Medicaid of 25,000 that we get each year, which helps offset our expenditure to have the health hub at our schools. And then we have our federal title funds of the $95,008. And you'll see there we have the, and we didn't project it there for 2022. 20, 20, you'll see that we actually broke that down. Idea B is zero. $48,000 will be used from Title II to offset the Chief Academic Officer position. $25,000 for the pre-K and then a Title I pre-K reading math intervention. You'll see that's where we talked about that is fully funded by Title I. For a total assessment out to the districts of that one million four hundred twenty-five thousand nine hundred and twenty-seven dollars, and then the assessment percentages again are up top above that. Tara, There's some. Me. Yep. Tara, on the figures for the Medicaid. Yep. We originally had three eighteen in change, and that's a negative one eighty. Yep. I, but that's not so. That's not in the budget. Actually, should no. that. Of 138 be over in that column? We are budgeting $180,000 of Medicaid revenue versus budgeting $318,000 of Medicaid revenue. All right, so 
it, because it's got parentheses, there's a change. I, I guess I don't follow that. That denunciates it's that. their revenue taking it, it. It's a deduction from the expenditure up top. So it's offsetting the 1.8 million. So we have to subtract that to get what your assessment is. So it's shown as a deduction from your the total budget. So you take the 1 million 806 927 minus the 24,000 minus the 2,000 minus the 180,000 minus the 25,000 minus the 48,000 minus the 25,000 minus okay. the 77,000 to get us to that 1.425927 as your assessment. So those are deductions of offsetting revenue to the expenditure budget. Okay. Does that make uh, more sense, Don? No, I'll have to meet with you. <laughs> okay. It doesn't. It doesn't. I, okay, so we're subtracting it from the total. So the total is the 1.8. Right, no, I hear you, I see it. And then the formula is subtracting the 24,000 from the 1.8. So that's why it's in parentheses. So we're deducting it. Right. Same thing no, for I, all those other lines. I so follow the way I see it, Don, is those deductions are coming out before they come up with what they assess each of the towns for. Because if you look up at the top, the one right. four two five is what we're assessed. Right. Right. I, 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 it's just a formatting in my own head. That's all. I appreciate that feedback, Don. This looks a little yeah. different. So I appreciate the feedback. Yeah. And I can make that different in the future. We can change that. Okay. Any other discussions on this? Um, I had a question. Aren't there some expenses that the districts pay directly to the um, SU basically on how they're getting used? So, you know, I thought that the tech, like our technology position was originally paid out of our local budget. I thought we moved to the SU budget, but right. we were paying that. It basically. was, Andrew. That's a shift we're presenting. Right. That those would but be I thought we back. were still basically, yeah, we're being billed back by those just based on what we're using. No, when we centralized technology, we wanted the flexibility to be able to maneuver them all around. It okay. wasn't going to be a direct bill back. Okay. So but that would just be assessed out in your SU assessment. Okay. Um, for where on the revenue are the direct billback things though? Because I know there's some that I've seen on the um, warrants that come out that you know we're paying. That well, say. right? Because we used to we used to bill back directly technology. We're we're saying we want to assess it out, not bill back directly. This was part well, of us. Is there anything to... that is billed back directly now? Like I know, yes, like we home to school Netflix transportation will continue to be. So we get the bill from Butler's bus for home to school transportation. We pay that at the SU based on the fact that transportation needed to be centralized. Transportation is, however, still budgeted locally as an assessment in your local budgets. So you will see every month continuing moving forward where you are paying back the supervisory union for your home okay. to school transportation. Same so thing with- So any of those costs just don't show up in this budget? Basically. They're not in the SU, that's still on your local budget, the transportation assessment. One of the other bill back line items that you'll continue to see is the Canon lease. And that's because they write one contract for the Canon lease and it comes to the SU, the SU pays it, and then we bill you back for the specific Canon equipments that you have at each of your locations. Right. That's budgeted for locally, it's billed against that local expenditure when the bill back is processed. So those two are the big ones that you will continue to see on your bill backs, on your monthly warrants. So it says it's in that from the SU, but basically it's only budgeted. It's not, doesn't show up in these SU budgets. No, those saying. are locally budgeted items. Okay, thanks, that clears it up. Yeah. All right, anything else guys? Anything else for Jamie or Tara that they want to include? I want to show you guys the SPED side of the revenue as well. Okay, Ray, if you can put up the one it's titled WRVSU FY2122 SPED assessment. Thank you.
And then also let's look at, this one is actually two separate pages. So let's look at the SPED budget first, Ray, page seven. Not sure I'm getting that reference. Um, WV, WRVSU FY2122 SPED budget 121620. And then if you could go to page seven, it says special education revenue. Tara, how is this one allocated back? It looks like the percentages are different. Yep, special education is based on usage. The ADM, average daily membership, where your SU assessment is based on an average of the average daily membership and enrollment. That was something that was agreed upon by the SU board, I believe. Don or Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say 2015. I would say yes, about then. That's when we merged, when we became the new SU, I think is when that was agreed upon on how your assessments would be calculated. And I thought there's a requirement that we're supposed to re-up that agreement every year, but I'm not sure that that's been done. I do not know the answer to that. John, I think that, if I recall, um, and I this is without benefit of notes, but I think that was uh, that was when we were doing that kind of phase in, because the percentages uh, 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 varied for some of the towns. You know what they what they were suddenly being assessed changed a bunch. Um, so I think, like the first couple of years of that, we 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 revisited it as we tried to as we tried to to, to balance or, or or to ease that that transition for a, a, a couple of districts. I, I, that's how I remember it, Carl. All right, go ahead, Tara. So on the special education revenue, you'll see that we have the expenditure reimbursement, which is the special education report that we submit. We get 56.35% of that for eligible expenses. So that number has gone from 3.4 to 3.3 million. Extraordinary reimbursement is based on the chart that follows on the lower pages. We have 340,000 that we can use as offsetting revenue. Our block grant is a number that's provided to us through the Agency of Education, as well as the local share contribution of the block grant. And then we have our Idea B basic flow through, as well as the Idea B preschool, and then our triple E revenue are all offsetting. And then the Medicaid revenue that we discussed when we were looking at the current revenue and expenditure report that we offset for our Medicaid clerk's salary. So that is total SU special education revenues of 5.482079, which leaves the member town assessment of $2,628,672, which you'll see is a small decrease from last year of $168,712. So then that takes us, if you want to go to the assessment page now, Ray, that you originally had open. This shows the recalculated special education assessment and what each of your district's assessments will be, and then it broken down by the monthly assessment fee. So, so the special Karen, assessment so I'm correct, is that, that first one, the change of 59,762 in special ed for FBUD. Okay. I, I don't know what that goes to. If you... Sorry, that goes to what's in FY21. That part of the chart didn't print out it's versus what your current assessment is. No, I, I understand that, but I'm seeing decreases there. Is that like the 20.5%? Is that FBUDS? Yes. So if you look at the chart below, you can see, sorry, I'm pointing at my screen. 
FBUDS percentage is 20.5, GHUDS is 5.5, RSUDS is the 10.8, Sharon's is the 17.7, Strafford's is 10.3, and RUDS is 35.2. So the upper chart is just showing the difference between what you're paying today and what your projection is for FY22. Nice. So even though the central office assessment has gone up as a result of the difference in revenues, the special education assessment is going down as our projection. So the net effect is a reduction. Why is Sharon's up? Because their percentage changed in the assessment? Yep. It's based on, yes, their average daily membership and enrollment. So their percentage is shifted. Because they've grown. Okay, any more discussion? Anything else, Tara? That's all. Sorry, I muted myself. That's all I have unless you have questions. Great. Questions, guys? All right. We do have a motion and a second. Wait, Kathy, can I say one thing? Sure. It's Mike, sorry. Um, the only thing I would say is I don't have any problems with this budget. Um, I, but I just like hearing, you know, from earlier motions and people talking about not um, possibly passing their budgets. The one thing I would say is, since I've been in the board, the supervisor, I know we're, we're, I've heard some complaints about past budgets, and I agree with them. Um, but I've also been there and watched us pretty blindly, I think, past budgets in the past. Um, so I don't think we can throw all the blame um, off the boards. So one thing I would just say is as you're worried about it, like now is the time. Like I, I think I've heard people say this is a pretty fair budget and I, and I agree it is. But if you're worried about that stuff, like I know you don't want to be on here all night, but now is the time to tell Jamie, to tell the office, like if there's something that we want that we, if you don't think it's sustainable, we need to tell them now and not be here next year complaining. If, I'm not, if you guys understand what I'm saying, I guess I just, I don't know. I sat there last year and that budget that went through probably should have never. And I think Andrew was the only one who, who brought a question about it last year, I believe. All the rest of us sat there and, said, and just agreed with everything and passed it. So there is some blame on us for why that budget was a little out of control last year. Um, and so I just, I would just caution everybody as you look at it, if you feel like you, you want to support it, but you think it needs to be lower, it needs to be said tonight is all I'm saying. Thank you, Mike. Any other discussion, guys? Are we ready to call the vote? Okay, calling the vote. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Do we want to go down roll call? Yeah, we should do roll call. Sorry, guys, I made that a little confusing. We'll keep it to Aaron. 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 Aye. Amy. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Carl. Aye. Don. Aye. Lisa. Aye. Roy, Megan Payne. Aye. Mika Tucker. Aye. Michael Gray. Aye. Robert Gray. Aye. Sarah Root. Aye. Stacy Peters. Aye. Susan K. Aye. Kathy Galuzzo. Aye. Well, I thank you, but I, I want to say I really thoroughly appreciate the candid feedback. And I think you forgot Sarah again. No, I said Sarah. We got Sarah. 
So we voted unanimously, unanimously yes. Go ahead, Jamie. No, I just wanted to say thank you. And, you know, I'm looking for continued feedback on the way we're trying to present stuff. Like, Don, your candid feedback is helpful. I want to try to make this user friendly for you and the community. So the more you can give Tara and the business office feedback on how we're trying to present things, the better. Because um, we are trying to make certain it's user friendly for you, but also our communities. So thank you. You know what would be helpful for me? I'm one of those... Um older people who likes writ I like it in, on paper so when you're giving when you're doing a presentation like this it's really it doesn't I like to have it in front of me so I can flip back and forth so if you sent this out before and I could print it then I would have it in this meeting I and and I could it could it's easier for me to follow and and you know that maybe that didn't work for everybody, but that would really work for me. I, it was in the pack. It was sent last Thursday, Sarah. But maybe we should PDF it. Yeah, instead. Right. I didn't, I didn't see helpful. this part in the packet, yeah. but uh, that may be my fault too, um, or that is my fault. Uh, but yeah, okay, thanks. Well, I'm wondering if it's easy if we maybe PDF the important pages or something. That's helpful instead of having it in the tab. It's just me. I mean, it's who I am. It's what I like, how I like to, it's how I process information. So. Can I just make a quick comment, please? Sure. Stacy, are you doing the minutes? So it's very important that the dollar amounts for the central office and the special education budget are included in the minutes. We got dinged in our audit because that was not done in previous years. So if you need me to get you numbers or anything, let me know, because we need to make sure that that's in the actual minutes. Does that need to be in with the motion? It yeah. does. Okay. Yes. If you can send that to me, Tara, just so that I can copy oh. and paste and not have to worry about operator error, that would be the best. I will write that up and send it to you. Thank you so much. Another point of subject, Kathy. Um, Earlier tonight, we had a roll call vote, and evidently there was a member that wasn't a voting member that we asked to vote. Is there any way that we can get a differentiation of who has the right to vote and who hasn't? Is that, or is that not germane to these calls? Um, we haven't had, I mean, normally we haven't had that done. Um, I think Jim Jamie asked her an error one person but yes we should make sure we know who okay. are voting okay. um what else do we have superintendent's evaluation tool did everybody receive the survey did everybody do the survey well that would be <laughs> the next question um if if you if it, Somebody on here has not received the survey, please let us know um, for board members and please get that filled out. Did ever, is everybody working on it or have it completed at this point? Um, and you don't have to answer that. That can be rhetorical. That's just me saying, please get them done. Um, they're important and will be helpful for Jamie and us going forward. All right. Um, we already approved the budget. Is there any other business? Um, the only thing I would say is there's is talk. I don't know if it's happening in other districts. I mentioned it earlier. There is talk about possibly holding the votes in towns. I know the Tumbridge Select Board is going to have a conversation tomorrow night and decide. Um, I know that in the state they're talking about making it available to vote later on the whole town meeting day, a different day, so that you can do it in person. Um, Maybe if towns are deciding, we can kind of get together and talk about trying to do that in the same time frame, um, so that, that we're not all over the place. I know um, that having an in-person vote in March would probably likely be impossible. So for those who want to meet in person, it will be helpful if we could push it out. The Secretary of State is saying you can't if you do a March meeting, you cannot do it in person. You have to do a virtual. Um, meeting 10 days prior to within 10 days of the meeting and it has to be or within and then you have to do an australian ballot and you have to vote 
to move to Australian ballot on that. Um, they also don't think they'll change the date until the 15th when they come into session. And uh, the war people who want to run for off for, for uh, school board need to have their, um, it doesn't have, to, it's a petition, but not, you don't have to have signatures on it. It's due into the town clerk on the 14th. So it's due before that. So the times are, are uh, off. Are walking. Good to know. I, I had a, that was going to be my one issue. Other, other Kathy, I meant to mention it during my report. Has the SU in the past, like what have we done in regards to letting folks know that we had a vacancy on the board? Has there been a process for that? In each district, has the SU ever communicated that out in the local paper? Uh, is that anything folks want to think about doing? It has to be done now because it's well. No, I know. I mean, that I would. That's why I was going to ask. I just you in, know, in I our think district, it's a different type of year. Uh, your town clerks and things are reaching out to a lot more, looking for assistance with communication. I didn't know if you wanted me to, if we wanted to just use local front porch forums. Like, I didn't know what you guys were, we could put out a warning. Um, I was just looking for some direction from you on how I could so, help. So, Jamie, typically it goes on an F bud in Tunbridge and Chelsea. It goes on our warning that we have an, that we have an opening. That's where we let people know. Um, but that, that's so you had your Kathy, because Kathy, I'm going to interrupt you with the warning we have to with australian ballot let folks know who's running right people need to file their petition, so that's different mm -hmm. right. than what we're used to that's why i'm asking that question we've run an ad before on the bethel and royalton pages in the herald um just to let people know um and to let them know that they can reach out if they need help with the process and they want to run. Okay. Um, we typically don't because uh, we're a tiny district and don't have the extra budget, but I wonder if all of us pooling together might want to post the openings in our respective districts <clears throat> as one, um, as one ad or as one promotion. Well, and I think that we also have like a Facebook presence. We also have front porch forum. So there are things that places where people have started looking for information over time, um, which are free. And also um, we, I think we could use, so I agree that that one ad, um, but then also utilizing those social media posts could be helpful. And in the past, the leaving member has always tried to find someone that was interested so that right. it wasn't left vacant. Yeah. Another point that I'd like to just point, just to mention that if everybody's going to be going later in the year, voting budgets and things, that's going to create a havoc with our contracts and our timing. So just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I'm going back to the... Uh uh, vacancies in Stratford, we we it's always been a floor vote, so we've always recruited people. Not we, but somebody in town has always recruited somebody at the meeting. Um, we've never put the onus of the person who's leaving, who's who's going off, uh, for them to find it. And there've been years when board members have actively tried to find people, and also years when it was probably inappropriate for board members to try to do it, and you let somebody else in the community. Mm -hmm. Uh, do that. So it didn't look like you were um, uh, fixing the board. Stratford will probably put something on the listserv. Uh, we have a meeting, a joint meeting with the select board after Christmas, where I think we'll make that decision. And we'll, we'll uh, my guess is it will be something will go out onto the Stratford listserv to about it. Um, so I, you know, um, I can let you know after that if we need your help, Jamie, but Maybe what we'll leave it as is that you'll reach out to me if you need help. I just, I don't want you to think that I'm just blanking on it. It's on my radar and I'm happy to do whatever you need. I'm just looking for some direction. That's all. I could go ahead and plan on using, uh, we could put that under your board tab even on the website and I could at least communicate that way. 
um, if that's helpful in regards to what we know is upcoming. But at least there's some information out there. So if you just give me some direction on what you need, I'm happy to help you with it. Okay, thank you. Right. Any other business? Jamie, you have executive session personnel on here. Do you need an executive session? Uh, we do. Oh, wait, Carl's got his hand up. Yeah, okay. no, I wanted to just follow up on that superintendent evaluation because sure. uh, there was I, I remember there being Carrie having sent a deadline out about that. And so I wanted to let everyone know that the VSPCA or the, the Vermont School Boards Association expects us to have completed that document uh, by the 28th of December. So for, for all of you that, that, that like me have, have somewhat procrastinated, I wanted to make sure we all heard that hard, uh, that hard deadline that the, that the VSBA has asked us, which is to complete that survey by the 28th. Thank you, Carl. All right, all right so um, do I have a motion? Is there anyone on that cannot be? We're going to go into executive. There is. So I, ju I just need, I need you guys, I'd like you to entertain a motion to go into executive session for personnel and to invite in the business manager. So moved. Second. Second. Our next meeting is January wait, wait. You came out of executive session with no action taken. Correct. At nine. Yep, 12. we're out of executive session, no action taken. You got that, Stacy? Uh, next meeting date is Monday, January 25th. Is that a full board or an executive board? We haven't had an executive board. I mean, you guys have been getting good turnout for your full boards, but we had a full board business to do. I'm fine with an executive board based on what we have on the, you know, upcoming stuff, but that's a few old. Yeah, I, we haven't had an executive board. It's up to you guys. Um, well, the only the only business out of this meeting is to further the superintendent's evaluation. I think I don't know of any other business ratification of this of the support staff contract. Oh yeah, possible yes. possible yes. ratification. So possible. Yes. Yes. thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Thank good you. point. We should do a full board then, Jamie. Yeah. It's full board. And then just thank a you, reminder Sarah. that we may have to do a special meeting for announced tuition rates for those of you who meet after the 15th of January, because that is the deadline for the announced tuition to be set. Before the January, okay. Okay. Essentially, clear your calendars, the month of January's budgets, tuition, you name it, we're doing it. In the town books, we're all gonna be working on those together. <laughs> all right. So we can get that motion to adjourn. Who would like Move to, to adjourn? Second. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. And I hope happy you all have a good day. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. See you on the other side. Bye, everyone.